worship. Turn, if you will, to the book of that open for a bit, and we'll be back there. The Bible is a very layered book. It is hyperlinked from front to back and all through it. One story builds on another. The prophets exegete the law for us. And those who came after the prophets in the time of the exile, they took the law and the prophets and looked forward with it. Where is the king? When will he come? And the New Testament writers gathered up all these materials, the law, the prophets, and the writings, and said, what does this mean now that we have seen Jesus the Messiah, the risen Lord? And so we're going to be in two or three places tonight. We're going to be right here, and we're going to be back in the story that, that Tina read for us at the beginning of the service with Jesus entering the city. And we're also going to be with Paul uh, as he writes to the Corinthians about what it meant when the, ex, when the Israelites had uh, gifts from God and, and didn't pay close attention to them. Uh, and we're going to relate that to the story of the people waving the palms as Jesus came into the city and what would they do with this gift that God is now offering them. Well, last night, last evening, was the beginning of Passover. And so it was when Jesus and his disciples came into the city again. They had all been making this trip their whole lives from the Galilee, making this walk and coming into the, the great city through the ancient gates. But the last three years, people had noticed Jesus and his disciples, and they were there together, perhaps for the first time in their lives, maybe uh, that they really knew each other and that they were coming together. 1,500 years of tradition already, 2,000 years ago. Big, noisy crowds. He raised Lazarus from the dead. Let's see what this is going to mean. Is it going to go somewhere? There was excitement. I guess if I could pick a word that would describe this day, this beginning day of Passover, entering the city with all these crowds, it would be anticipation. Anticipation. What does this mean? So I just want to take a minute and think about the different groups of people that were there that day and perhaps we can begin to see where we fit in with this crowd. There were 12 disciples that Jesus had chosen, and they were all around him. Twelve were walking in the center of the eye of the hurricane, if you will, that day with Jesus. One of them would betray him, would betray their hidden position. One of them would deny him and they would all be scattered. But they were protecting Jesus from the crowds a little bit, as best they could. They were watching the crowd, wondering, is this, is this what the kingdom of heaven looks like? Is this, is this happening right now? They're also thinking, this is a trap. I hope he has a plan for us to get out of here. These crowds are like the ocean. They're too big to control, and that's good and that's bad. It's good in the sense that it's protecting us from the authorities, the ones up there on the walls watching us. And so they pass through those ancient gates, and they're thinking to themselves, this feels like walking into the lion's den. We're here, we're inside the city. Well, there was the 12, and then there were throngs of Galileans, they were so proud of their homegrown son. They had seen the works of God. That's where Jesus did most of his miracles. His big miracles, feeding thousands of people, calming the lake. And then there were Pharisees, people who believed in the resurrection of the dead, who believed this was the word of God. 
just like Jesus and his disciples. But they were thinking very carefully about this. One of those Pharisees was going to be one of two people helping to take Jesus' body down off the cross later that Friday afternoon in the coming week of this Passover week. Is he really claiming to be the Messiah? They're still trying to get their minds around this. He does and says amazing things. Well, this one who helped with the body, Nicodemus, he had said, nobody can do the things that you do unless he's from God. He got that. Everybody else kind of got that, but they really couldn't bring themselves out to say it. No, this is not the picture we had, and we like to be in control and we'll decide if he's the Messiah or not. And I think we've lost control. The Sadducees, they were the political operators. They, just, they, they obeyed the first part, the law of Moses, but they were really having to ignore a lot of it because it speaks of Messiah in there. They didn't pay any attention to the prophets. They didn't believe in a life after death. What they believed in was being in control and being powerful and being wealthy. And they were calculating, and they had done their calculations. They already decided. This man raised Lazarus from the dead. They didn't deny that. But some of our best people started following him on account of that. It's very simple. He has to die. And in fact, we think maybe Lazarus will have to die as well because they're a threat to everything. We just need the time and the place. We need the opportunity. We can get to him. We're sure of that. And then there were the crowds, just throngs of people, and they're hoping that all of this means something. They're waving their palms. Will some of the people that day waving palms, will they be later on in the week yelling, crucify, crucify? We have to ask ourselves where we would be in all of this. Oh, but they were so happy that day. Every year we do this. But this is the third year where Jesus is really the center of activity and it is building to a climax. What's going to happen? The children seem to know what they're looking at. They don't care about politics. They want to encourage him to come as the rightful king. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We want to just say that because it annoys the Pharisees and the Sadducees so much. They hate it. Let's yell more, Hosanna, save us now, son of David. Yeah. Which ones would be yelling crucified by the end of the week, perhaps? Well, you and I, right now, right here in this day, in this time, we're faced with some of the same decisions. We all loved marching along with modern day evangelical, if you will, Christianity, when it was fun and festive. We've had decades of the Christian entertainment industry that's now a multi-billion dollar market. We've had decades of addictive emotional highs from our concerts and our conferences. And I've been at lots of them and they're good things. But we have made, in the midst of those things, we have made idols out of the very clever and the very beautiful and the very uh, articulate. What about when it gets serious, like in other places? Chinese believers being hauled off to concentration camps. Nigerians being slaughtered in their villages for believing Jesus. Iranians coming to Jesus and being imprisoned, imprisoned in which they are beaten, raped every day perhaps, hanged in public, families ruined. It's 
different than our world. It's different than our sometimes silly, sometimes weak Christian culture where we base everything on how we're doing on the internet, where we base everything on how something makes us feel or how we appear instead of the fact. We live on our feelings, but the facts are that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, come what may. And so our formerly Christian-based or Christian-like culture in the United States is fracturing into tribal zones. I think real believers are coming together, but the culture in general is fracturing. The moral consensus has shattered about what's good and what's not good. Wickedness is now made holy. It's sanctified. Goodness is now made evil. If you are a part of a good family, a strong family, you're making somebody else feel bad because they don't have one. And so you're a hateful person. That's the world we live on. Sin is being spewed on all of us and perhaps by many of us. And in the middle of this craziness, Jesus is coming down the dusty road on a donkey. And you've seen him before, and you've considered him before. But the craziness is serious now. It's happening, and we're here. Jesus is here, and whatever does it mean? What do we do? It's not easy, but it's simple. As he comes to you, choose God's gift. God's gift is Jesus the Messiah. That really is the long and the short of the choice. Choose Jesus. Well, let's... Let's dial in our, our scripture here that we've, we've opened to, 1 Corinthians 10. Paul is writing to a mostly Gentile uh, church. And as followers of Jesus, he gives them a warning from Israel's history. And this is going back to the original Exodus. Now, Passover is the celebration of the Exodus, but the actual event that's at the bottom layer of, uh, as we study this. So let me, let me begin the first four verses here in chapter 10, 1 Corinthians. And Paul is using them as an example of how to live and how not to live. He says, for I do not want you to be ignorant, brothers and sisters, that our fathers, our fathers, he calls them our fathers, these are mostly Gentiles, but he's talking about the Israelites, and so he's bringing the, Israel, or bringing the Gentile believers into this definition of our. Uh, not saying that the church has become Israel or that Israel was the church, but the fact that, that uh, we who follow Jesus have been adopted as sons into the covenant of Abraham. I do not want you to be ignorant that our fathers were all, note the word all as we go through here, there's five of them. They were all under the cloud, that is the cloud and the fire, you know, the cloud by day and the fire by night. They could see God, the presence of God, and all passed through the sea, that is they walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. How much faith does that take, those walls of water? They all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. In other words, they were committed. When you, when you walk through, when you follow this cloud out into the desert where there's no food or water, and when you walk through that sea, you're committed, just like when we're baptized into the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So that's what it means to be baptized into Moses. They're committed. Verse 3, and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they were drinking from a spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Messiah or Christ. 
And so this Gentile church who doesn't have a New Testament, they know the law, the prophets, and the writings because Paul and Aquila and Priscilla uh, have been teaching them. Um, and so when he says, our fathers, he's saying, you're connected to these people because you're part of this flow and this river of tradition and story that has come down through time now. You're a part of it now. You've been welded in because of Jesus and what he has done. And so there is a unity. Five times he says the word all. All the Israelites. And we all claim to be believers. We are in his house, in his family. And then Paul talks about this business about the same spiritual drink and the spiritual rock that followed them. That is a very difficult verse. I know because I looked up quite a number of people who are quite a bit more educated on this than I, I am. They spend their whole lives looking at uh, a few verses like this, and none of them agree on what it means. Uh, but this they agree on is that this, this was an understanding. It had to do with the manna and the quail and the water. You couldn't live out there without water. You need water yeah, to live out in the desert. Like you can't really go a day or two without it. And that place gets really hot uh, in the summer, unbelievable hot. And so uh, the point is, is that this is from God every day, this manna. And they're taking that as an implication that God provided their water as well. And there's a place at the beginning before they get to Mount Sinai where God says, this is the rock. Uh, speak to the rock, tap the rock with your, your staff, and you will get water for everyone. Think of this, all these throngs of people, a million people and all their animals. They were keepers of sheep. They needed a lot of water. And so Paul says this was, uh, this was Christ with them already. Uh, and so we'll, we'll let that interpretation stand there as is. So manna, bread from God, water from God, and now Paul knows that Jesus is the manna from heaven. He is the bread of life. They asked Jesus, are you greater than Moses? Jesus said, Moses gave you bread. I am the bread. I'm the sustenance that you need to press on. I'm the sustenance you need to live into eternity. So now Jesus is the bread from heaven. He is the living water that gets us on our journey. So God's gift, God's gift, Jesus, is available to all. Just like all the Israelites walked through the Red Sea and all of them painted the blood of the lamb over their door lintels, so the sacrifice and the resurrection of Jesus the Messiah, the Lamb of God, is available to all. You don't have to be born any special way. He doesn't care what gender you are when you come to him. He doesn't care what race you are, what ethnic background you are, what family you are. You can come to him as you are because all of us have something in common, and that something in common is that we need him. That's it. God's gift is available to all. So people at the beginning of this Passover week were deciding uh, about Jesus. And just like today, some said yes, and most said no. Today, some say yes, and most say no. Even among those calling themselves believers, John's Gospel tells us that, that, that people in Jerusalem, there were a group of people saying that they believed, or, or they, they believed in Jesus, but Jesus did not entrust himself to them. He wouldn't spend the night in the same place where they were because he didn't trust their belief. So John, who says that you either believe or you don't, in his gospel, he explores what it means to believe. 
it's an important uh, definition. Uh, in the West, we like to say, well, I believe it. In other words, I plug that into my brain and say, okay, I believe in Jesus. Nope. When this book says believe in Jesus, it means everything. It means you give how much? All. That's right. We'll get there in a minute. And so this next verse, verse 5 in, in 1 Corinthians 10, a very ominous verse about the children of Israel. Despite the fact that they were all, they all came out under the blood of the Lamb. They all followed the cloud, saw the cloud by day, the fire by night. They all walked through the sea, to, sea together. They all heard the voice of God himself speak the Ten Commandments into their ear. They all did that. Despite that, verse 5 says, Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and they were struck down in the desert. Wow, that's scary. Do I think that once you're saved, you're always saved? I do. But I think whether or not you're saved, uh, that's, that's something that's down inside of you, and you uh, and the Lord have to be uh, together on that one. We'll leave it there. But if by faith you follow Jesus, you must take in the manna from heaven. You must drink in the living water. You must follow him and no one else. And that is easier to do when you're in trouble uh, like the believers in China and Iran and Nigeria and places like that. I think it's harder in the West where we're wealthy. There are just so many options. Well, what do I need this for? I can just do whatever I want. Let me read to you from the book of Hebrews, a passage where he talks about this thing, uh, he, this comparison between Israel's failure in the desert and our potential failure right now. We think, well, those guys, you know, whatever. I mean, they saw miracles. Couldn't they just? No, we're in the same predicament Hebrews chapter 2 says, We must pay most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through the angels was binding, and he's talking about the law being received at Mount Sinai there, since the message spoken through the angels was binding, every violation and disobedience received its punishment. How shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? His point is the people in, in, in the Exodus, they didn't know Jesus. We do. That means we have a bigger liability, if you will. He goes on. This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him, the eyewitnesses, God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. And so he's saying all this amazing glory that stands on top of the foundation of the first exodus is, makes us more liable before God. We have great gifts, and we need to be grateful for those gifts and live into those gifts. And so God's gift of Jesus, truthfully, is rejected by most, most, most people. I think most people who would call themselves Christians probably are just cultural Christians. And I bring that into what we would call believing churches as well. So is the gospel just God's slick sales pitch? You know, I mean, we've kind of made it that way, that Jesus loves you and wants to be your buddy. And I believe that, and it's true, but that's only part of the message. Jesus said, you'll have to take up your cross and follow me. Wow. And that is coming closer and closer to the life we are living right now. I gave up my life for you, says the Lord Jesus, now you give yours to me, 
and you will be so alive like you never imagined. Make your life a sacrifice every day. Whatever I do is on behalf of the Lord. That's what he asks of us. Knowing then that God's gift is rejected by most. Let's finish out this passage just quickly. Paul talks about all these things that they got involved with, that the children of Israel did. He says, now these, ha- this is verse 6, now these things happened as examples for us so that we wouldn't crave evil things just as they did. Don't be idolaters. And skip down to verse 8. And let's not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And to verse 9. And let's not test the Lord as some of them did. Verse 10. And let's not grumble as some of them did. Verse 11. Now these things happened to them as an example and it was written down as a warning to us on whom the ends of the ages have come. Think of all that we've gotten to see and understand. Verse 12, therefore, let the one who thinks he stands watch out that he doesn't fall. No temptation has taken hold of you except what is common to mankind. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can handle. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape so that you will be able to endure it. God's gift of Jesus demands our whole life. He talks about craving evil. Folks, we are just absolutely in a tsunami of craving evil. It comes at, to us from every possible form of media and, and, and school and whatever else, that whatever you feel, you should just do. And all the ruined lives from that barrage of evil. Idolatry We love our stars inside and outside of the church. We love to idolize people. And our ultimate idol in this day of secular um, religion, our ultimate idol is ourselves. Whatever I think is true, whatever I feel is true, whatever gender I want to be, that's what I am. That's self-idolatry. And it's ruining people's lives bringing great suffering to people. They need Jesus. Sexual immorality. It can come to you right on your cell phone. The filthiest garbage in the universe is at your fingertips. It's at the fingertips of whichever of your children have these things as well. And they're looking at it. And it's ruining the possibility of them having good and normal family lives because of what they have been scarred with way, way... There's, you're never old enough or mature enough really to deal with that. But it is ruinous on children especially. And we see in, in this last year, my goodness, last two, three years, all of our Christian idols, they're falling like stars from the sky because of sexual immorality. Don't test the Lord. We play a lot of games with God. We sort of keep, we, we want to keep him in our back pocket. And, you know, the question is, God has to do what? He doesn't have to do anything. <laughs> we serve him, not vice versa. Don't grumble, he says. We are First and foremost, as Americans especially, we are consumers. We shop around. We know a deal when we see one. We treat church the same way very often. God isn't having it. It's not like deciding between, you know, Walmart and Target or Costco. You find a community that God has brought you to and you be part of that community, and you live with them come what may. That's the church. So we are grumblers. We like to kvetch and complain. And the only way out of that human nature trap 
He says, those sins are common to all mankind. We're just doing what, what's natural to us. The only way out of that trapped, trap is God's gift, Jesus the Christ. Jesus comes to all. He is rejected by most. And he demands our whole life. It's not a very good sales pitch, is it? But he is the Lord of all. He brings us where no one else can bring us. But he demands everything for us. Well, we're entering this Passover week where the Lamb of God will be sacrificed once for all as Jesus enters the city, one time for all. The Son of God will be raised from the dead, never to die again, and will create a pathway to that life for all who will follow him, all who will call him Lord and Savior and King. And that forgiveness that comes from his death on that cross, that resurrection to life, that is all yours through God's gift of Jesus the Messiah. So, this, don't let the craziness, the confusion, the chaos, which are all intentional, I believe, to a large part. Life is chaotic enough, but there are plenty of powers that be that are creating a whole bunch more chaos on top of it. Masks, vaccines, politics. Don't let those things pull your eyes away from the goal. Don't let them pull your eyes away from who's coming down that road on that donkey. Jesus is the same no matter how crazy, chaotic, or confused it gets. And the question is the same. Will you have him as your Lord and Savior? Will I have him as my Lord and Savior? That is the question before us today as we begin this week. We're going to share this Wednesday night in the Lord's Supper right here. Um, I'll be taking us through a, a quick reminder of the Passover meal, but we won't be having a meal this year. We're not quite ready to do that. Uh, but we'll be passing out our normal uh, communion uh, little packets, and we'll, that will be part of our evening together. And so plan to be with us. Uh, in person or online, if you will. And then Friday night, we're going to be in here. Uh, probably won't stream that one, so you'll want to be here for that uh, to, to remind ourselves of what it meant for the Lord Jesus uh, to die on our behalf. And then, of course, Sunday morning, we will celebrate his resurrection. Let's pray together.